Sapa, which it breaks down basically to Nighthawk. My people are the Three Mountain people, the Mojave people, the Tsunama'a people. And being the only one of that particular group of people in this area, I became known as Three Mountains, just referring to me as a Mojave person. And you are what you do. I'm a silversmith, I'm a Three Mountain silversmith, so therefore, Everybody calls me Three Mountains. Your name changes uh, throughout your life as an Indian. And uh, we even have a name that nobody else knows but ourselves. And I can't tell you that. My father was Czechoslovakian uh, background. His parents were born in Czechoslovakia. He was born here. Uh, my mother is Mojave. Of course, born here. <laughs> uh, mixed cultures. Uh, I think that uh, it, it adds something to, uh, to my life to have uh, a reach into both cultures. And I've, uh, I've found interest in both. Who were your heroes or, or mentors or role models? One was Hill Kanu, who was a Navajo fellow, Zatsky Tsinail, a silversmith. He was a silversmith, he was a jack of all trades, he was a musician. He played guitar. He had uh, been a butler or a valet for Segovia at one time, the great guitarist. But he was quite a guitarist himself. Fascinated me and made an made impression on me so that I studied guitar myself. A fine silversmith of the, of the old crude uh, system where he used a hammer and a chisel to cut things rather than a saw. And today, of course, they use laser saws and things, but. Back then, you used a chisel and a hammer, and you severed the piece of silver, and then you filed it till it was smooth. And he was from that school, and quite quite learned. And that's where I really cut my teeth in silversmithing. It gave me an inkling of what it's about. It gave me the ability to learn, an understanding of life in general, what to expect of life, and what you have to give to life in order to get out of it, which to me was more important than than just telling me something and saying, this is the fact. Here's, here's how you learn to get the fact. Everybody I meet falls into that learning process. You evaluate people when you meet them. At least I do evaluate them. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. You learn different methods of doing this. I'll be teaching somebody something. They'll ask a question, which causes me to think, now I've learned something that I didn't know I knew. It's the fact that they stirred it into existence, you know. So I'm always learning from people. I took part in the Korean War, and I think that probably, when all is said and done, had the greatest impact because of the, the severity of it, the, uh, the, the, the pure horror of it, both among the civilians, among the military people. It was uh, something that you never really forget. I don't dwell on it. I received a, a rank of a temporary rank of master sergeant, a field commission. Uh, I was actually a staff sergeant, but battlefield uh, master in the Korean War. Uh, I was there from 50 through 51 into 51 in combat. But I think I learned enough to, to appreciate life and appreciate people much more for having watched them destroyed. For, for no no real reason, you know, it's what, what real reason is there for conflict like that? Terrible, terrible. Uh, in the beginning, I, I kind of rebelled against the structure. It's very structured, of course, and uh, I was once again a free spirit, you know, and, uh, and because of, maybe because of my heritage and the knowledge of my heritage, me knowing about my heritage and, and uh, some of the negativity that happens when you're cross-cultured like that uh, might have added to my rebellious spirit, I don't know. But uh, I, I was a re rebellious recruit, I was. I, I paid the penalties for it. I was, I was a very 
very strong young man. I, I, did, I had that heart murmur that they found, but I, physically I was very powerful. Uh, my drill instructor wanted me to go airborne because he had been airborne. Uh, he'd fall me out and, and, and fall everybody out and he'd say, now take your, your M1s, we used M1 rifles, and hold it out in front of you like this with one arm. Well, I would take one, mine and I would take the guy next to me and grab him by the muscle and hold him straight out this way. And he would get, oh, he would get mad, but at the same time he was, oh, you've got to go airport, you're not going to. I didn't. <laughs> it's been a, a Native American, to use the politically correct term, a policy to support the country in times of warfare. The enlistment of, of Native American people is very high, not the draft or, or the uh, forced enlistment, but the actual enlistment. It's very high in times of conflict. Uh, probably goes back to the warrior syndrome of, of years ago, you know. But I don't think I would have avoided going. I think I would have went regardless. But I probably would have had more, <laughs> more uh, anxiety about it, knowing what I was getting into. You never know until you're there, really. You have no concept of what conflict like that is like until you do it. You know, you go there with all the, the heroic aspirations and, and expectations. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. As a youngster, I was subject to movies, to stories, to, to uh, all this vainglorious stuff that goes on. So you go there as a young person, you know, with all these idealistic I'm going to save the world, and I'll be a hero. Tell him bullets start flying, and you see people getting torn to pieces, and well, <laughs> it changes fast. It changes fast. Then you become someone hardened you have to to survive. And it takes a long time to get over that hardness, that, uh, that shell that you put around you. I don't think I've ever lost the shell. I think it's still there. You do put a shield around yourself. I've been married a number of times, and I sincerely believe that that shield doesn't let the other person close enough to you. It, it, it's a barrier, and I still have it, and I'll probably die with it. Well, Sarah, they're dressed right. Let's do them. Teaching what, what I've learned through the years I've spent on this earth, and that has to do with my children, which are, of course, extremely important to me. But once again, you have to teach them. You teach strangers, you teach your children. And sometimes teaching is hard. People don't want to be taught. They want to know, but they don't want to go through the process of learning. They don't want to be told. So teaching becomes a sneaky art. You teach in roundabout ways. You tell jokes, you, you make inferences. You, you teach in, in, in a lot of funny ways. So teaching, I think, is, is important. It's the bringing up of children. It's the maintaining of a relationship. It's meeting new friends. It's maintaining friends. It's all part of teaching. Okay, we'll have some questions and answers later, okay? okay. Trying to give them a foothold, a little boost, you know, just reach up and try to help them over the fence a little bit because they're going to get a lot of splinters going over that fence and you can't stop it. You're going to be, you're going to be pulling out splinters. It's made with hide, excuse me, deer hide or buffalo hide that's been dried and then decorated. We call this the heart of the people, the heart of Mother Earth. Most important lesson you think you could respect, respect, respect for themselves, respect for others. You can't have respect for others without respect for yourself. If you have respect for yourself, you'll you'll avoid getting involved in in uh, activities that are going to get you in trouble, that are going to destroy you. You have too much respect for yourself, respect for your elders, respect for your friends. All stems from respect for yourself. That's the first thing I think we have to instill in our children, is that they are somebody. 
they're somebody very, very important to, to us and to themselves. And then they'll make you just as important. And everybody they meet will be important. So I say respect. The legend of the flute, how it came to be. It was a young Indian out hunting one time, and he heard this sound. He couldn't be sure what it was. It was sort of a whistling, but it was a little bit different. Very pretty to hear. So he went to investigate to see what it was. And he went down in this little valley by a stream, and there was a tree there, and the wind was blowing through this tree. And he looked up and he saw a branch where a woodpecker had been pecking into the tree and left holes in the, in the branch. And the wind was blowing across this old branch and was making the sound. So it gave him an idea and he took a piece of wood and he put the holes in it just like the woodpecker did. And he finally got it just right and he made the flute. Now when young braves are courting their girlfriends, in other words, they're, they're looking to have a date with their girlfriend. They don't go knocking on the door and say, you want to go to the dance or you want to go to the movies? They would stay out in the side in, in the brush somewhere and they would play their song on the flute. So it's become known as the love flute because of that. Truth is probably very pervasive. Uh, truth is very easy to tell. Truth is very easy to understand. Uh, truth is self-perpetuating. If you lie, you have to lie again and again and again to continue the lie. And then you have to create lies around the lie to, to validate the lie. With truth, you don't have to. It's, it's self-perpetuating. It's easy. Truth is easy. Next. <laughs> Tradition is understanding uh, what, you, what you are, what you're from, uh, what your family is from, what your family held as ideals. Uh, tradition is something you're going to teach your children so that they will know what your family's ideals were and what their, what their goals were and what their failings were. You know, tradition failing is just as important as winning because it's part of the learning game. And that's tradition. I trust most everybody. I trust people until my trust has been uh, misused. I think that uh, we have to trust people if we want to be trusted ourselves. If, if you are untrustworthy, you're, you're not going to trust other people. You know, it's, it's a natural thing because you understand that people, that you're hoodwinking people. And if you're hoodwinking them, they're hoodwinking you. At least you believe they are. Uh, you, you put yourself into everybody else's shoes when you meet them. When you ask a question, you already know the answer that you expect. Not necessarily the one you're going to get. And the reason you, you know that answer is because you've put yourself in the other person's shoe. And trust works the same way. You put this person, yourself in the other person's shoe, they want them to trust you. You want to trust them. You want to like people. I do. I want to like people. And I trust everybody until they take that trust away. So trust is, is, uh, is something I think that we afford to everybody. It's like a hello. I'd like to welcome everyone today. Thank you for traveling from near and afar. I also want to thank Creator for the vision of this medicine wheel and especially Bobby Shafrat for his work with members of the committee on creating this medicine wheel and the gift that it provides us to honor Native American spirituality here at VAMC Northport, to honor the ancestors who are Native American who have walked before us and those that will come beyond in future. Well, everybody, thank you for coming. I'm Bobby Shafrat. Uh, today we're here to dedicate, for a dedication to the me of medicine wheel. Uh, we've been working on it for over a year now and we'll still be working on it. It's a very special place. Most of the stones have come from somewhere special. And uh, 
we'd like at the end for people to introduce themselves and open up for questions and comments, if you can stay. So what we'll do right away is we'll start the ceremony right now. Gail will start with, a, with an opening prayer. I'm Gail Eaton Star Boy, and I'm also a veteran of the Army in four years. Now we ask that sunny Three Mountains Campbell enter the circle, bless the pipe. grandfather gave me the idea every time people come here they should take a stone with them as a reminder of their visit many different cultures will go to a place of significance and leave a stone I'm saying let's take a stone each time we visit each time somebody visits they take a stone until it gets down to the level that it needs to be then we'll know we're, we've completed our job so today I'm going to ask each of you to see a stone that appeals to you. Take it. You can keep it for your medicine bag or whatever. You take it with you. You can have a round dance if you'd like. You have to have the east. You have to have the west. You have to have good. You have to have evil. You don't know one without the other. Male, female. Everything is in balance. And when it's in balance, the world is just beautiful. Everything small goes smoothly. When it's out of balance, we have chaos as we have now in the world. So we have to seek a balance, and we all have to fight for that balance and pray for that balance. And I think that's the reason so many people are here. Because, you know, this is an event where we can all draw together, we can all gather something from it. And I want you to take a little stone with you before you leave today. You can take it now if you wish. The people who left the items here if you want to come in and get your items. So thank you to Bobby Shafford for the work he did here. And he perseveres, he keeps at it. I want to thank him and uh, I want everybody to know that he's, he's a member of my family, just as strong as, as if he was born into my family. Uh, Uh, right now, Ted Blue Medicine Green will come in and offer us a closing prayer. I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. It's very special to us, to us, the committee, the VA itself, all veterans. Before you leave, there's a bowl of tobacco and a wooden bowl over there. And I explained to some people before what we do. We take a pinch of tobacco, we say a prayer with it, we put it into the urn where there's coals burned, the smoke carries our prayers to the Creator. I want to thank you all. Oh, now we'll do a round dance. Yeah, round dance. <laughs> round dance. The ceremony part is over, now it's just fun. <laughs> it also warms you up a little bit. <laughs>
I like to try to uphold what I what I feel is uh, you might call it religion, belief, a belief system, and uh, I think. I think we have to, to look at the entire universe, to look at ourselves. We're all part and parcel of the same anatomical structure. We're the same matter. So there has to be something that keeps this in place. And that would be a supreme being, if we want to say a being or an entity or whatnot. And so this is a, a, a belief factor. This, this is the thread that goes through everything we do, whether you be a, a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, uh, follow the native church. It still has that, that fabric that, that weaves through everything we do. If you didn't have a belief system and you walk through earth as, an, as a total atheist, you'd only be half a person. You'd have nothing to look forward to. You'd have nothing to lean on. You'd have nothing to, to structure what you do. What reason would you have for being a decent person? <laughs> you know. So I believe that the belief system is, is uh, a power power that we have to acknowledge. You see them in the stores this time of year. Some of them are green, some of them are yellow, they look like little tiny pumpkins. And when you dry them, they get like this. I'll pass this around and you can see this. And then once they're dry, we fill them with beans or pebbles, decorate them, and they, I think, were all put here to pretty much find our own way. Um, and once again, this is a learning process. I, I don't necessarily believe in reincarnation, but I can understand where that belief would come from because of the learning process again and, and, and developing as you go type thing. Uh, I think we do that in our lifetime. I think we, 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 we go these different plateaus as we go along. And an older person such as myself has had the advantage that a younger person like yourself has not had yet for having learned certain things. You may be more schooled than I, but I, through experience and through happiness and heartbreak, I've been able to, to reach little, diff, little de different plateaus, which I think is all part of why we're here, to reach that existence that we, we're, we're all striving for. We have to learn our way there. Even older ways of making rattles. I think the most valuable lesson you learn is that you can learn from other people, but you can't learn from yourself. Because, you know, your, your knowledge is at this point. It's at, at this point. And to get at this point, you have to learn from somebody. I think you have to be, I won't say leery, but be very thought conscious about what is told to you. Not to be distrustful, but to be, you know, weigh and balance things, uh, especially from teachers or people like myself who are somewhat elders and therefore teachers. Some of the things we say can be misconstrued, can be mis misused, uh, misinterpreted. Uh, and the reason I say that, I think of, of situations like Wounded Knee, the original Wounded Knee. We don't know if Wavoka, who was the originator of this ghost dance, religion taught as he felt was right or what he taught was received wrong but whatever it was it was a great tragedy this particular belief system he put forth whether it was put forth badly or received badly somewhere in there it was a terrible tragedy and a lot of lives were lost and and for all intents and purposes he meant well so you have to be careful about what you accept as, as, a, as a solid truth and as a, a belief system because it can, you know, just kind of go off in wild directions. There was a time in a very recent history where a lot of culture was lost. At this particular time in history, I think it's being recovered. I think it's being practiced more by the young people too. I think there's a yearning for a return to some of the basic teachings, and I think it's good. You know, I think right now uh, the Indian person couldn't ask for a better response by his young counterparts. The reservation system lacks a lot of things. 
It lacks humanity. It lacks self-esteem. It's a system that has taken the people and gave them a very helpless or a useless feeling. Suicide among young Indian people up until a couple of years ago far exceeded anything among any other ethnic people. Um, alcohol is still rampant, alcoholism. And it's sort of a helplessness that, that permeates the, the reservation system. Uh, there's still animosity between the, the buffer zones, between the Indian and the Caucasian people in the buffer zones. There's, there's problems there. A lot of them are self-governing. Therefore, the education system would normally be handled by the government itself. That's, that's governing the reservation. It isn't. It's handled by either uh, religious organizations who come aboard and, and are teaching, or it's handled by the government, government schools. So you have these, these various uh, autocratic controls going on, and it, it hurts the system. It's a perpetuated welfare situation. People feel they have no worth. It's a dead-end street. There's no jobs. There's nothing they can do. Uh, the health system is very poor and very inadequate. The native culture was... Uh, greatly hindered by the teaching systems that were put in place. Indian children were not allowed to speak their own language. They were forced to cut their hair if they happened to be a long-haired uh, people. Could not wear traditional clothing. They were expected to act as... Assimilation was what they were looking for. They wanted to assimilate the native people with everybody else. Forced assimilation, which didn't work. What happened is you had a generation of people who were not wanted by either side. They would come, they would come home and try to, to utilize the skills they had just learned to find that it fell on deaf ears among the elders. The elders wanted to continue what they were doing, right or wrong. It didn't help the situation. Uh, what they had learned was not sufficient enough to make them, quote, a white man. So they didn't function on this side of the coin. So here was this lost generation. And this went on for a while. And it's where we are today. This generation is now my generation. And we have been able to have a better rapport with our younger people for both directions. The society has opened up a little bit. So these younger people now are already out in the world making their living, making their way. Many people don't even know that they are native other people don't understand that they are native or even care, which is fine. But those young people at the same time are able to come back and take some of their culture and enjoy it. So this, this is a good thing now. Profiteers, of course, are, are, are right on the scene to, to sell the great whiskey escape thing. It's just a very tragic, spir down-spiraling situation. Reservations are not the answer. Uh, unless they can govern themselves properly. Can't be governed from the outside. Then what, what you have basically is a concentration camp. Really, if it's governed from the outside, it's a prison. If it's governed from the inside, it has to be governed properly. Uh, some, some reservations have been able to do this. Navajos have a very fine government. Um, some of the uh, Pueblo people have a very strong government system. There isn't an overall blanket system of saying, okay, this is a and A gets this. These people are B and B gets that. It's, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G and nobody knows for sure who gets what. Uh, it's a very, it's a quilt, a patchwork quilt. Some are state recognized reservations. Government has nothing to do with it. So therefore the, the government, when I say the government, I'm talking about the federal government, uh, does not uh, subsidize what they're doing uh, with health plans and so forth. State has to subsidize. Uh, local governments have to subsidize. Uh, same token, when you have a federally recognized reservation, the state has nothing to do with what goes on. So the, the state government is somewhat peeved about this. Here they have this group of people in their midst that they have no control over. The U.S. government gets upset because your radicals now want to start a, quote, nation of their own and issue passports, you know, uh, reservations. And it's it's a political football.
That's what it is. You can't take people off of welfare throughout the country, force them to go to work, uh, and then keep a select people group of people on welfare and not allow them to go to work because you won't create work or there's, there's no work being created in the area. So they will have to do away with it sooner or later. If they want to do away with the welfare, they have to do away with the reservation system. Many years ago, these were used. And they also made them out of out of leather to look like turtles. And when the baby was born, the umbilical cord would be put in here and saved until the person was an adult, and that protected the child. And it was given to the child, and the child would then bury it later on. But that was the original purpose of these. Now they're just kind of nice pouches. This would be a medicine bag, such as the one I wear here. When we say medicine, we're not talking about aspirins or things like that. We're talking about spiritual medicine. When we say medicine, referring to, to ourselves, we don't mean aspirin or Tylenol or, or a serum of some sort. It's a, it's a belief system. And the medicine is a, a, um, a luck or a good fortune or a misfortune. Medicine can be a misfortune too, but it's sort of a self-induced protection. There's, there's certain items in here that I find important to me, whether it be from things that I have experienced or memories or things in our belief system that, uh, that we are taught are important to us. They are, they're placed in here. And whether it's self-induced uh, psychosomatic or whether there is a deity that that overlooks things that go on. I find that wearing my medicine bag helps me get through the day and get through situations. It's my little personal protection. It, it to me, is what a crucifix would be with a Christian. And I guess that would be a, one way to, to look at it. The Navajo people and the, the Apache people have a greeting, Yatahi. And anybody in the Southwest now uses Yatahi as a, as Olo, whether it was their language or not. Among the, uh, among the Plains Indian, you have uh, greetings like Haukuola, uh, which would be Sioux, which is a uh, friend, you know, meaning friendship. And throughout, uh, throughout the Plains states, you'll hear Haukuola, you know, it's become pan-Indian. So the language is, there are people who speak their language fluently, and, and uh, you can get up into New York State among the Seneca people and Ondaga. Uh, Cayuga people who, who still maintain their language. Going to Southwest, the Hopi people speak their language, and Navajo people, people speak their language. Uh, you go down into Grand Canyon, you have the, uh, the Havasupai people, they speak their language. A lot of people still maintain the language. Can't there be a, a middle ground where people can say, hey, you know, what we're doing is, is self-destructive. Let's do something right here. That's what I'd like to say. It'll be just one <laughs> happy form of humanity. <laughs>